Hey, this is episode six, and I'm Scott Martin, and these are Martin stories. These are stories basically about our family growing up. Um, I grew up in Kenya, um, spent some of my last few years in Indonesia, and have traveled and done a bunch of different things. And so a lot of these stories are being uh, collected for posterity. And like I said, this is number six. Um, I'm going to talk just a, a little bit um, about uh, some of the adventures we had um, in in Kenya. Um, this one was in, from high school. So we've probably been in Kenya, I don't know, at least four or five years. Um, I was maybe a junior or senior. Um, my mom had enrolled uh, at Azusa Pacific University in their master's program, and they would send their professors uh, to Kenya where uh, folks in the region would gather together um, for the for intensive courses and a lot of it was online. And it's amazing that they were able to accomplish that uh, pre-internet. Um, but that was the case and so she was in classes and um, my dad's sister and I had traveled with her while she was in classes and so we occupied ourselves during the day. Um, on this particular day we got up early and went to Mount Langana. Um, it's in the center of the Rift Valley, and if you're not familiar uh, with East Africa, the Rift Valley is a, a defining marker. It's a scar uh, down this down um, the east side of Africa, uh, stretches from Ethiopia down through Tanzania, um, and it is an amazing formation. And in the center of this formation, or along in, inside the valley, there are a number of volcanoes where this fault line um, created a weak structure. Long and is one of those. Um, amazing uh, volcanic um, structures, and it's a beautiful site. Uh, it's a very iconic mountain site out in the middle of this valley. Um, one of the things that's unique about this is that there's an escarpment that rises several thousand feet above the, the floor of, of the Rift Valley um, and looks out over the Rift Valley and Mount Longanot. So you're actually kind of looks like you're at eye level um, with this amazing mountain if you're up on the escarpment. And the significance of that view is that that was the view from my dorm room at Rift Valley Academy. Uh, I could see Mount Longanot out my dorm room window. Um, it was really amazing and certainly sunset time, sun uh, in the evening was, was truly a, an amazing sight. So the opportunity, and this wasn't the first, but it was the, um, is the most memorable one um, of us going up Mount Longanot. I don't remember if there were others of us besides the three of us. Uh, in this particular party, I just remember the three of us, and I remember uh, climbing up a very, very gray, dusty, ash dust um, path. It was apparently a very dry time of the year uh, because I just remember it just being a cloud of dust. You'd step, and it just poof. It's so super, super fine. That ash dust is just uh, beyond fine, um, and that would puff up as we as we walked. And uh, we arrived at the summit around noon. I remember eating lunch uh, shortly after we arrived. I'm guessing, given that I was a teenager, I was ready for lunch probably from 10.30 on. So it could have been any time after that. Um, and we arrived at the top and there was a rumor that um, a Cessna, a, a two or four person aircraft had flown up into the crater of Mount Longanot. So Mount Longanot is this amazing spike shaped mountain out in the middle and at the top it has this flat curve to it and what you're actually seeing there is what remains of the mountain because the top has been blown off from the volcanic activity and so this slope to it um, kind of the saddleback of it is actually inside the crater so when you get to the peak and when you get to the top you're actually looking down into a hole um, and it's rimmed all the way around um, and the rumor was that that this uh, aircraft had flown up into the crater and had circled around and had crashed inside and that you, from certain points of view you could see and so we we'd heard that this um, that this uh, aircraft was crashed into the embankment on the uh, what would be the east side of the escarpment um, west facing so if we went around to the west edge of the escarpment, we would have a chance of seeing this. That was also the highest point of the saddle. So if you think of a saddle as being this slope and then having a horn on it, uh, the horn of that saddle is kind of the far west side, uh, kind of southwest side. So um, we hiked around um, and had just 
barely began. I mean, we got to the peak and you can actually, the path, there's a path that goes all around both sides. For whatever reason, we just picked, we started heading right. Um, and we had just begun when we first heard and then very shortly thereafter saw the first baboon. Now, baboons um, are kind of iconic creatures, right? You have, you have the, the long snout uh, with bright colors, a purple and bluish color. Um, they're famously um, colored buttocks, hairless buttocks. Um, we've encountered baboons before. I find them very fascinating creatures. Uh, the first time within the first week that we were in, in Tanzania um, is when I was just like 11. Um, saw my first baboon and we threw it a banana and it sat on the side of the road and peeled the banana, which for whatever reason struck me. When I gave my dog a banana, it just ate it, right? Um, it didn't try to get to the inside. It just was... And baboons kind of have a dog-ish looking face, um, but the very dexter uh, dexterous, I think I just made that word up. Um, they could use their, their fingers really well and they and actually peel this banana and sit there on the side of the road on their hunches, um, eating a banana. So I find them fascinating. Um, I find them more interesting to watch from the safety of a vehicle rather than on foot. Um, and the reason for that is they're larger than I expected. Um, Pre-Africa, simply looking at them in the book, think of them in monkey form. I'd seen them in stuffed form, you know, like this big. Um, and so I, I kind of stretched it out in my mind and thought, you know, maybe the size of a German Shepherd, that's a pretty good sized dog, baboon, maybe in that category. Um, the one I encountered this day on Longanot um, was an Ascari, a, 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 a Ascari is the Swahili word for like watchman, police, right? He's the watch out, the, the, the guard baboon. Um, and this one, given his job description was you know, like a bouncer. You're like, this is a bigger one, right? But sitting in the path is a baboon that sits with his head above my waist. That's big. His head is my size. His teeth are much bigger than mine. <laughs> so if our only uh, weapons to fight one another are our teeth. He has a huge advantage. Um, and he made a barking sound um, and kind of trampled the ground a little bit, made, made that startling sound. And we heard some, um, I'll describe it as yapping, some kind of noisy uh, ruckus behind. And we saw that there was actually a, a whole troop of baboons. And this was the lead guard. Um, and for whatever reason, they were up on this escarpment. So I don't know, we don't know, if they lived inside the crater and were coming up to the edge for some reason, or if they lived on the lower level, or if they were a troop that traveled in between. It was quite lush on the inside, which kind of made me feel like they probably lived inside. I don't know why you'd come out, right? Because it was dry and dusty up on the, up on the, on the edge. So whatever reason, I don't know their story. I didn't do an exhaustive interview. In fact, what we did was turn in the exact opposite direction and move very quickly around to the other side of the escarpment. Um, I wouldn't say we ran away like frightened little children, but we did hustle away uh, with an appropriate amount of caution. <laughs> um, and so, we continued to walk around. So we still wanted to get to the other side. Um, and going the other way was definitely in the opposite direction of the troop of baboons. And so that's fine with me. Um, and, and we got all the way around to the far side. Um, and it was actually beyond halfway. It turns out going this way, going the eastern version and along the south edge of the escarpment and up the other side, probably brought us around pretty far on the western edge. Um, to the peak, and we could get a really good view of the inside of the, the escarpment. We had binoculars. Um, we may have seen an aircraft in there. There was certainly something in among the trees. Um, but the view from up there, from that peak, was amazing. Um, and I just remember sitting there on a rock with my sister and my dad, and it's, it's like a series of snapshots. I don't know if we had a camera and I've actually seen pictures of us sitting there or if that's just frozen in my brain. Um, but 
I just remember thinking this was just so amazing and you just felt like you're literally on top of the world um, and that everything was beneath and below and whatever stresses of dating or sports or schoolwork, whatever was definitely gone at that moment. Um, and it was a really wonderful um, moment to experience with family. Um, I did discover something that day. And the reason I know this was my junior senior year is because um, my dad took off his glasses, his prescription glasses uh, to clean them. And for some reason, handed them to me. Um, I don't know if he was like, so he could get out a cloth to clean them or switch his binoculars. I don't know why he handed them to me, but I put them on um, just to see what he was seeing and was amazed how clear it was through his glasses. I just thought, oh my gosh, this is very vivid. And I, I remember that very distinctly. I don't remember saying anything out loud to anyone. I just remember being in awe how beautiful it was through his glasses. Um, and it wouldn't be for another year and a half before I would get to college and go for an eye exam, which I had not had in a while, and find out that I indeed needed glasses. And uh, as I walked from the, from the eye doctor's office back to campus, I was in absolute awe how you could see individual leaves on trees. I didn't know that. I thought they were kind of watercolory. Um, I don't know when my eyesight had degraded, uh, but I do remember there in college going over to the gym and picking up a basketball and thinking, this game is way easier now that I can see the basket. And uh, my shooting percentage went up significantly. So uh, for my high school friends who were critical of my long distance shooting skill, I will say in my defense, I couldn't see the basket. So um, I'm not sure what the story will be for episode seven, but I thank you so much for, for tuning in and listening and certainly comment if you'd like to hear more stories about this or about Indonesia or travel or whatever you're more interested in and whatever has piqued your interest in these stories, uh, let me know in the comments and, um, or if you're seeing this on, on Facebook, let me know uh, below and, and I'll certainly try to get more of those stories. But that's episode six for today. Baboon on Mount Longanot. Have a great day.